Anyway, for those that just came back, I have updated the lecture notes on my website. So go and re-download them. There's typos are fixed. There's some examples added. Um, in general, it's, yeah, it's 0 0.01 better than the previous version. And uh, probably every week I'll just update it like that, just fix what I noticed that week. And at some point soon, I'll add some extra chapters before we get to them in the class, I hope. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Recording's working, yep. So what did we just show? We were looking at the Fourier transform. We defined the Bochner integral and so on. The other topic I was gonna talk about today is extensions of operators. Which is probably the most important topic of the course. In a sense, the whole course is really about when can you extend certain operators? How does it depend on the Barnack space? How does it depend on the operator and so on? The question is, given an operator on scalar valued functions, how do we define it on Barnack valued functions? Now in the finite dimensional case, this is kind of easy, but I'll list it as an example. If you have an operator T, which is bounded say on L2 of R, this is a curly L here. And if you have a function F that maps the real line to a finite dimensional real Barnack space RD, or it could be CD, it can be complex as well. Then you can write your function as a, a vector of scalar valued functions. And this is classical. I, I assume you've done this sort of thing before. You take the you take the standard basis of RD and you look at the components of the function in each of these directions. So you can see a vector valued function as a, a vector of functions that are scalar valued, if you like. That's a classical way of doing it then you can define your extension of T, maybe call it T tilde of F. You just take that vector expansion of the function and apply the scalar valued operator to each of these scalar valued functions component wise. This is a natural thing to do, it preserves linearity and all of that. You can do this with a general basis expansion. And if you do this with respect to a different basis, you'll get the same operator by linearity, by change of basis and so on. And I'll make this comment, does not depend on the choice of basis. But this isn't how we're gonna do it. So don't worry about that definition. This is just to reconcile the classical viewpoint with what we do. Are you talking about linear operators or not necessarily linear? Yes. Operators? Bounded linear operators. Okay. Yep. If you didn't have linearity, you wouldn't have this independence of basis as far as like this definition wouldn't yes, yes. really make sense. Yep. Well, people do this sort of with the maximal hardy little. Oh, yeah. People do this all the time with particularly with sublinear operators. You, there's a nice theory for sublinear operators, but not for general Banach spaces. These are for Banach function spaces or Banach lattices, which are particular types of Banach spaces. For them, you have a canonical, what's called lattice extension of a sublinear operator. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about extensions of linear operators with respect to general Barnard spaces. Okay. Yeah. Let's fix my screen for a moment. There we go. So let's make the definition, the actual definition that we'll use. And in fact, let's hide the previous thing just to emphasize that we don't care about it. Let's take a measurable space, no measure. I'm not defining extensions of operators yet, I'm building up to it. So we take a measurable space and a Barnack space. And let's also take a set V, which is a set of measurable scalar valued functions. <clears throat> 
So A measurable scalar valued functions on S, just some subset. A subspace would be better, but let's just take a subset for now. We define the tensor product V tensor X to be the linear span of all of these functions F tensor X that I introduced in the first lecture, such that F is in V and X is a vector in X. So remember, these are like one dimensional functions. You take a vector and then you take a scalar valued function and you put the scalar valued function in the direction of the vector. And these functions, we call these elementary tensors. This is standard terminology from the theory of tensor products. If you know tensor products, this is actually just an algebraic tensor product in the classical sense. If you don't know tensor products, don't worry about it. So this is a linear span here. These are finite linear combinations. And because they're finite linear combinations, we don't need to worry about any kind of convergence of sums. So this V tensor X, this is a vector space. Not a Barnack space. We don't talk about convergence. We don't talk about any particular norm we put on these functions. It's just a vector space of X valued functions. And all of these functions are strongly measurable. Uh, because we are just taking finite dimensional combinations of basically scalar functions. Everything's separably valued. You can use petas here if you want. You don't need petas. So for example, if we take our set V to be the set of characteristic functions of measurable sets, then the tensor product V tends to X will actually just be the simple functions valued in X. Because when you take what well, these, yeah, when you take, hang on, I've confused myself. The definition of the linear span of these elementary tensors that have characteristic functions and vectors is exactly the simple functions by the definition of simple functions and by the definition of linear span. You could also take, for example, V to be just LP, scalar valued functions on the space. This is a particularly important example. We're gonna use it all the time. So you get the finite linear combinations of LP functions tensor with vectors. Then you'll get that V tensor X will be a subspace of LP valued in X. Showing that it's a subspace of LP is not too hard. We'll actually show it in one of the next lemmas. So these algebraic tensor products are kind of the, the most important dense subspaces we're gonna deal with of the Buckner spaces. Maybe the second most important after the simple functions. So we have a proposition. We take our measure space. We take a Banach space. And we take P between one and infinity, not including infinity as usual. Then the algebraic tensor product, well, this is, yeah, this, I should have said this is called the algebraic tensor product. Algebraic because there's no convergence, there's no norms or anything like that. The algebraic tensor product of LP with X is a dense subspace of the Bachner space. So we can use it as a place on which we can define extensions of linear operators on scalar valid functions. The proof is a nice little abstract proof. Firstly, just to show that the space is actually contained in LP. If you take a scalar valid function F and a vector X, we know that the elementary tensor is gonna be strongly measurable. That's not, not a problem but we need to compute its LP norm just to ensure that it's actually in LP. So we write out the definition. 
So P is not infinity here. P is not infinity, but in for the containment in L infinity, this will still be true. I'm just not proving it. But the density you need P to be less than infinity. Yeah. So where was I evaluating the LP number this thing? This vector X doesn't depend on S. That's a key thing. So we can pull that out. We get the norm of X to the P because I'm taking the peak power here just to make everything a little bit cleaner. And we get the modulus of F of S. So this is just the norm of X times the peak power of the LP norm of F, which is finite by assumption. So this element, elementary tensor is actually in the Bochner space LP. That's not a problem. Now for density, how do we argue this? You might think we need to come up with approximating sequences, but no, we don't. We have something simpler. This algebraic tensor product, since LP contains the simple LP functions, this algebraic tensor product contains the simple scalar valued functions intersect with LPS, tensor X, and that's already dense, right? This is actually just the simple functions valued in X intersect with the LP functions valued in X because a function is in this, well, this is actually just equal to the set of functions F that are simple and have finite measure support. Because if you have a simple function with support, with infinite measure support, then it's not gonna be an LP because you're gonna have some constant value there's gonna be an infinite measure set where the function has a constant value. I think I mentioned this earlier on when we were talking about the Bochner integral. So this algebraic tensor product contains the simple LP functions and this is dense in LP. So this subspace contains a space that we already know is dense. So it itself is dense, no work there, easy. So we can move on. And we can define our, what are called tensor extensions of operators. And just like with the Bochner integral, this is kind of the only reasonable definition you could make in a sense, maybe it's not so obvious that it's the only reasonable definition, but eh, it is. Let's take two measure spaces. Let's be fancy and take two of them this time. <coughs> we take P1 between one and infinity, not including infinity. And we take P2 also between one and infinity, but we can allow infinity there. We're gonna need some density properties for P1 that we don't need for P2. You can imagine what's going on here. And let's take a bounded linear operator T from LP1 of S1 into LP2 of S2. Oops. Bounded linear. And it's important that it's linear and bounded. Let's take X to be a Banach space. Now this is the most important definition of the course, I think, other than what a UMD space is. So let's get it right. The tensor extension uh, of T by the identity map, which is I from X to x to x is the map written as t tensor i going from one algebraic tensor product into another algebraic tensor product and it's defined such that t tensor i of an elementary tensor, F tensor X is TF tensor X. 
All right. And again, if you're familiar with tensor products, this is a tensor product of linear maps. This is how you define tensor products of linear maps on elementary tensors. And because these algebraic tensor products are the linear spans of the elementary tensors, this extension, uh, this definition extends by linearity to the whole algebraic tensor product and everything is well defined. And I think you need to do a short check that that's actually well defined, but it is. And to be well defined, this definitely uses the linearity of T. If T were not linear, this would not give you a well defined thing. I should say this is for all F in LP1 S1 for all X in X. Have a look at this definition for a bit because we're gonna use this quite often and it's gonna be worth having this strongly in our brains. I don't have a whole lot to say about the definition. It's just something one should stare at for a little bit. It also gives me a chance to drink some water. Perfect. So everybody happy with this definition? Anybody object to it, think it's not reasonable? Does anybody think this is not the most reasonable possible definition? <laughs> okay, good. The only objection you can really have, why do you choose the identity map? <laughs> you can choose any map from X to another Barnack space and you can get a different tensor extension of T by that map. And then it will act on the, the vector and elementary tensors in the way prescribed by that linear map. And these maps are also considered and these are reasonable, but in a sense, they're not canonical extensions. Like if you just have the information of a bounded linear map on scalar functions, and you want to say, how do I extend this to X valued functions? You're not gonna somehow twist it by, make, by making things act on the vectors in a different way. You're just gonna extend it by the identity map. This is reasonable. Now this map, I should say, this is a linear map between vector spaces. Nothing about norms here, nothing about boundedness or continuity. It's just a linear map on vector spaces, but it is defined everywhere. It's well-defined. So let's talk about these tensor extensions. So we know that this algebraic tensor product is dense in the Bochner space. So we can extend this tensor extension to a bounded map between Bochner spaces. if it's continuous in these norms. And this doesn't come for free. So if there exists a C less than infinity, such that this tensor extension applied to F, in the LP2 norm is controlled by C times the norm of F in LP1 for all F in LP1, S1, tensor X. So just to because clarify, it's, yeah. the, the reason you want the function to be continuous is so that you can pass limits inside the function for the density arguments, right? So like, you know that you can approximate any point yeah. by a sequence of points. Yeah, exactly. Like, I just yeah. want to clarify that. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. I mean, it's a classic thing in functional analysis, but sometimes yeah, yeah, you don't yeah, yeah. think about it so hard and you forget exactly what's going on here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It's actually a classic yeah. topology. Like if you have a, yeah, 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 if you have yeah, a sub, yeah. topological space and a dense subspace and a, a map which is defined on the dense subspace and continuous in the induced topology, then there's an, a unique extension to the whole space. And here you just pick an arbitrary approximating sequence and you write, you define this extension as the limit of that. Mm. And yeah. you check at some point in your career that this thing is well-defined independent of the sequence you picked. You check it yeah. once, you remember it, you, you never check it again. Thanks. Same as with the Bochner integral, yeah. Now, okay, so we have this property of, of boundedness of this map, which might not hold. 
And my notes that I've written here are terrible. I've forgotten where I'm at. I wrote these in a bit of a rush and they're not quite readable here. Okay, I have to make a definition. Let's call this inequality star. If this inequality star holds, we say that T admits a bounded X valued extension. And in this case, we define, oh, not define. Then in that case, we have a bounded, an, an extension of T to the whole Bochner space. And we denote this extension. We denote the bounded extension of T tensor I to the Bochner space LP1 by a few different things, depending on what we want to emphasize. We might call it T tilde sub X or just T tilde if we're not really emphasizing X or if X is clear from context. Or sometimes we'll just call it T if we want to be evil and forget that it's an extension. I mean, it's, it's a canonical extension, so it kind of makes sense you denote it by the same letter. But of course the extension depends on X. I'm going to emphasize that. The extension depends on X because this inequality here, star, that depends on X. It might hold for some X, but not others. In general, that'll be the case. It's gonna, you're not gonna have this extension property for all X, you're gonna have it for some X. Maybe you're gonna have it for X isomorphic to a Hilbert space and nothing better. Maybe you'll, well, yeah. There's a theorem out there saying actually every operator has an extension to Hilbert space and we might prove that at some point. So I just want to make a note. This inequality star is equivalent to having, oh, I mean, I'll say it's equivalent. It's just writing out the definitions. It's equivalent to having this inequality here. Just writing out the simple functions. This has to hold for all scalar valid functions fi in LP1, S1, and all vectors xi in x. So from this representation of the inequality, you can see this, this inequality is really somehow seeing the geometry of x in a way that's not at all clear. You definitely can't just prove this using the triangle inequality and boundedness of t. Like you can start to bound it. You get the left-hand side, use a triangle inequality. You're not gonna get the right-hand side without using some more properties of T. So look at that for a moment and just quickly convince yourself that yeah, this is a non-trivial inequality. It's not gonna hold for all operators. It's not gonna hold for all X. I mean, if you're not convinced of that, you will be soon enough. So I've been very pessimistic here and I've said, yeah, this doesn't always hold. The first thing I'm going to give you is a situation where it always holds. Which is useful. Maybe not the most interesting thing because it doesn't really give you any hints of the, the Barnack space geometry that comes in, but it, you know, it's useful. <coughs> so let's take a measure space. I might start abbreviating this as M space because I've written measure too many times. M space is a measure space. And P between one and infinity, not including infinity. Let's suppose that an operator T, which is bounded and linear on LPS is positive. Now, what I mean by a positive operator is that for all F in LP, such that F is almost everywhere, non-negative, not positive, but non-negative. 
we have that TF is also almost everywhere non-negative. So T preserves non-negativity of functions. That's called the positive operator. Then T admits a bounded extension to every Banach space. So for positive operators, there's no question about whether or not you have a bounded extension. You just always have it. But this uses a very strong property of the operator, positivity. Most interesting operators in analysis are not positive. But there are some important ones that are. That's worth keeping in mind. So you always have this nice criteria for, for positive operators or for an operator to have extensions to every space. One question. Yep. Is it very important in this theorem that both measure spaces are the same? No, I'm just doing this for simplicity. In the notes, I write it in full generality. Two measure spaces, different P's are okay. It just gets tedious to always write S1, P1, S2, P2. Yeah. So in fact, you can say a little bit more. You can say that the norm of the extension of T, mapping LP to itself, is equal to the norm of the scalar operator T mapping LP to itself, or LP1 to LP2, if you have two exponents. So you have a quality of these norms. And in fact, you have a pointwise estimate. If you take the pointwise extension, if you take this extension T tilde, and you look at its pointwise norm as a function, this is actually almost everywhere bounded by the scalar operator applied to the pointwise norm of F, which is a stronger thing still. Basically, this says that for a positive operator, your vector valid extension is always dominated in norm by the original operator. And this certainly doesn't hold in general. It's very much a thing about positive operators. Let's give a proof. Um, the pointwise estimate, let's call it PE for pointwise estimate implies everything else. Well, it implies that the norm of T tilde is controlled by the norm of T. The reverse estimate is easy to show that the, the norm of T, norm of T tilde is bounded below by the norm of T. You just need to check on single vectors. You check on elementary tenses and you see, okay, you can't have a smaller norm than the original operator because all of the one dimensional aspect, all of the scalar valued stuff is kind of embedded in one dimensional subspaces. That's written in the notes, if you don't see that in your head. Let's see notes. So we just need to prove the pointwise estimate. Okay, how do we prove this? Let's say for all S in the space, well, it's going to be for almost all S. We'll see where that comes up. And I should say also for all simple F. So F, I mean, as always, it suffices to prove this on simple functions and argue by density. So let's write a simple function like this and write out the definition of the tensor extension on simple functions. So this is just T acting on a characteristic function times the vector Xn. And we have nothing we can use but the triangle inequality at this point. So that's what we do. Now, because T is positive, and the characteristic functions are non-negative, T applied to a characteristic function is also non-negative, almost everywhere. So we can remove this modulus here, almost everywhere. We can say this is equal to almost everywhere. This sum here, like so. So I'll just write here, this is using positivity of T. And this is equal to T of 
the following simple function. I should say t, uh, yeah, t of the following scalar valued simple function. where the values are given by the pointwise norms of the simple function uh, of the, yeah, of the vector valued simple function we started with. So this is T of the pointwise norm of F. And that is the, the pointwise estimate we wanted to show. The extension of T pointwise bounded by T acting on the pointwise norm almost everywhere. And that is all we need to show, simple. So just to reiterate, positive operators always have X valued extensions. For all Barnard spaces X which is good to know, but most interesting operators are not positive. So this doesn't tell us a lot, right? That's still have 10 minutes, I guess I can do one more thing. Let's give a counter example. Well, not a counter example, but a non example. Let's show some operators don't have bounded extensions. And let's go back to the Fourier transform for this. So I said in the first lecture, just as a, there's this theorem that says that the Plancherel theorem only holds when the Barnack space is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. We're gonna look at somewhat more general things than the Plancherel theorem. So remember Plancherel says that the Fourier transform is an isometry on L2 of R or L2 of RD more generally. I don't care that it's an isometry, it's bounded on L2. That's good enough for me. And of course it's linear. More generally, you've got the hausdorff young inequality. Which says that the Fourier transform is bounded from LP into LP prime. And this is for all P between one and two. So remember P prime is this Holder conjugate exponent. So two prime is two, one prime is infinity and P prime interpolates between those. So when P is close to one, P prime is close to infinity. When P is close to two, P prime is close to two. I mean, Hausdorff Young says this is bounded. I mean, you can say more. In fact, the norm is actually less than one if P is not one or two, but who cares? I mean, that's very interesting, but who cares? A lot of people care about that. It's actually very interesting. So let's fix P between one and two. Let's not include two and consider our Barnack space X to be little LP, which is little LP of N. So the LP sequences on the natural numbers. And consider the bound, which might not hold. Does the Fourier transform bound LR valued in X, so valued in LP into LR prime? valued in X. So do we have an X valued Hausdorff Young theorem? We know from lecture one that we don't necessarily have an X valued Poincaré theorem unless X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. So if we weaken it, do we still get something? Now let's, I'll say that this fails for all R greater than P. Not for all R, but for all R greater than P. So if P's three halves, for example, then this Hausdorff Young theorem is going to hold, we're going to fail for R close enough to two. So R greater than three halves. So not only does Plancherel fail for spaces that aren't Hilbert spaces, but for these little LP spaces, you're also getting failure of Hausdorff Young for large exponents or for large enough exponents. Let's show that it fails. Let's fix a Schwartz function f, scalar valued. Doesn't need to be Schwartz, but why not? That just makes everything well defined. Let's say it's supported on the unit interval. 
And let's also suppose that it has LR norm one, although this is not so important, just normalizing the function. And we need to define a vector valued function that we're gonna test on or a sequence of vector valued functions that we're gonna test on to show that this bound can't hold. So for all natural numbers n greater than or equal to one, we'll define a vector valued function f sub n. It's a little LP valued. We'll define it as a sum n from zero to capital N minus one of the translation by N of F tensor with the nth basis vector. If we write this in vector form, I mean, it's a vector valued function, but we can see it as an, an infinite vector of functions because LP has a nice standard basis here. You can write it as the vector F translation by one of F dot 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 translation by N minus one of F and then a bunch of zeros. So this is our vector valid function that we're gonna test on. First thing we do is we compute the LR norm of this function. Remembering that it's a little LP valued function. Uh, th this is in the, a certain algebraic tensor product. So in particular, it's strongly measurable, but let's not think of strong measurability too much here. Let's just compute norms. So let's write out the definition. This is the definition of the LR norm to the rth power. We write the integral over R as a sum from M equals zero to N minus one of integrals from M to M plus one. Because you see where this, these translated functions are supported on the intervals n to n plus one, because I've taken a function supported on the interval zero one and I've translated it by n. And in particular, I'm only going up to n minus one. So this function is actually supported between zero and n. So splitting the integral in this way is valid. Then I write out this norm of this function because it's a little LP norm. I take a, an LP sum over its components and I get f of t minus n to the p and everything here's to the r and p. It takes a, a couple seconds to think of that and realize, yeah, this is true, but this is what the norm is by definition. Now we notice that because this function here is supported between n and n plus one, because we translated it, the only terms that appear here are when m equals n, the diagonal terms, all the, all the cross terms are gonna vanish. And then inside this sum, because the cross terms vanish, there's gonna be no sum. So we're gonna have a single thing to a pth power to an r on pth power. So we simply get f of t minus n to the r dt. All of the cross terms have vanished and the P has also vanished incidentally, and this is gonna be important. You do a change of variables because you're integrating over N to N plus one and you have F of T minus N. So this is just the integral from zero to one of F of T to the R power DT. Now this integrand here, this integral doesn't depend on M and you've got N terms in this sum. So this is N times the LR norm of F, which was normalized to be one. So this is just N. Okay, you got to stare at it a little bit, but it's true. Okay, that's our first fact we needed to know. Now let's compute the Fourier transform of this function out of frequency Xi. This function is already given as a sum of elementary tenses. So the Fourier transform is gonna act on the scalar parts of these elementary tenses, the function parts, I should say. So it's the sum up to n minus one of the Fourier transform of the translation by n of f tensor with the nth basis element. Using the definition of the Fourier transform, you can see that this is true. I should have said actually the Fourier transform as I defined it is a tensor extension of the Fourier transform on scalar valid functions. Didn't mention that, but this is true. <laughs> 
I define the Fourier transform explicitly as an integral rather than as a tensor extension, but they agree. Now we know that the Fourier transform of a translation is a modulation, a multiplication by a complex exponential. So we get e to the minus i in xi of f hat of xi times the basis vector e of n. And now we see that this Fourier transform of f here that appears doesn't depend on n. All of the n action is in the modulation here. So this is f hat of xi, f being the scalar valid function times a vector, which is a bunch of modulations times basis elements. So having computed that, we can compute the LR prime norm of this Fourier transform. This is still valued in LP. Notice that the Barnack space here, LP doesn't change. There's no P prime occurring here, it's just P, yeah. So this is the integral of F hat of Xi to the R prime. And then we get the, the LP norm of this vector in here, which is e to the minus I in Xi to the P, to the one on P, and I have an R prime power as well. Now these complex exponentials, they're all complex numbers with modulus one. And I'm taking their modulus. So this is just a bunch, a sum of one, a bunch of times, n times. So this is n to the r prime on p times the L r prime norm of f hat. I don't need to know what that norm is, but it's constant. It doesn't depend on n. So if the Fourier transform is bounded from L r valued in little lp to L r prime valued in little lp, there will exist a constant c less than infinity such that this norm here to the one on r, so n to the one on p f hat r prime norm is less than or equal to a constant times what we computed here, which was n to the one on r. And this has to hold for all n greater than or equal to one. Now we can equivalently write this out as n to the one on p minus one on r is bounded by a constant divided by the norm of the Fourier transform. Now this norm here is non-zero because f is non-zero itself. So it's Fourier transform is also non-zero. So the right-hand side is constant and the left-hand side blows up if r is greater than p. And here's your contradiction. So that tells you that this bound of the Fourier transform can't hold for r greater than p. So this is a geometric property of little lp in disguise. Right? This is, we use the explicit structure of that Barnack space little lp to make this argument work. And I've got one minute left, so I can say one sentence in that one minute. What this says in modern language that we'll introduce later is that lp does not have Fourier type r greater than p. I'll introduce what Fourier type is later on. Fourier type is the validity of the Hausdorff Young inequality valued in X. And it's a geometric property of X and it's got a lot of other, it's got other equivalent formulations. It implies things, it's implied by things. It's quite interesting. And I will point out that LP does have Fourier type R between one and P and nothing better than that. This can be proven by using complex interpolation that I'll introduce later on. So sometimes you have some Hausdorff Young inequalities, but not all of them. It's an interesting thing for Barnack space valued functions. The case R equals one, you actually have for every Barnack space. The case R equals two, you only have for things that are isomorphic to Hilbert spaces. And as R approaches two, this condition gets stronger. As R goes to one, the condition's weaker. So there's a whole scale of Hausdorff Young inequalities you might, you might or might not have. And you can ask about a Barnack space, does it have it? How do I prove that it's got it? And so on.
Okay, that'll be the end of the lecture. Are there any questions about stuff, particularly that counter example, which is a little bit tricky? Yeah, I, I have a philosophical question about this counter example. So what yeah. is the property used of the Fourier transform that it cannot be satisfied by a positive operator? So that it intertwines translation and modulations. You have, you have hardly used modulations. You have immediately put... Uh, well, the modulation said that all of the dependence on n actually can be taken out in a sense, like has nothing to do with the function itself somehow. I mean, you have taken absolute value of the modulation immediately. So there could be yep. any other. Uh, no, indeed, indeed. Um, I think what's happening is that on the non Fourier side, you're translating, so your support is moving. But on the Fourier yeah. side, the support sort of clusters in one spot. Yes. Modulation is not changing the support. That's right. maybe what's but really But yet to is. have some sort of L2 boundedness, you need orthogonality. You need some extra orthogonality. Yeah. Like that. yeah. So then yeah. this is sort of indirect encoded in there somehow. Yeah. Well, but I mean, I you, you know all about wave packet yeah. analysis. So you're using orthogonality of wave packets to do that. Yeah. yeah. And the point is that in a general LP space, you don't have that orthogonality. You have a little bit of it, like you've got some Hausdorff Young. Like I said here, like little LP does have Fourier type less than or equal to P. Like it does have the LP Hausdorff Young inequality. Yeah, and then the, yeah. the less Hilbert you get, the more badly purely Banach you get, you start to lose that orthogonality. Yeah. It's, it's a nice counter example. You can really, I guess, learn a lot just from staring at it and thinking what's really being used. I mean, that's the perfect question. Like what is the real property that's making this fail? Okay. If you think hard enough about that, you start realizing, okay, what are the implications between Fourier type and other properties? Yeah. Yeah. It's quite subtle. Yeah. Very nice. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions? All right. We're done. I'll stop the recording in a second.